Hey, hey, how's it going? Like Tacey said, my name's Alex. I'm excited to be here with you guys tonight. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to be here. Uh, before I get started, I want to introduce myself a little bit. Uh, real quick, here's a picture of my family. Uh, that's my wife, Megan. I have a three-year-old little girl named Millie and a one-year-old boy named Wes. Now, last week was a big deal. It was Wesley's first birthday. And so I, I just have to share a picture with you guys. You, you ready for this? It's going to take a little bit of explaining, but <laughs> here it is. So this is Wesley's first birthday. You might ask, why is he dressed like a cowboy? Well, the theme of the party was how the Wes was won. I can't claim that. That was all Megan. And so, yeah, again, this is a classic one-year-old party. You give them cake for the first time. You see what they're going to do with it, right? Wesley reaches for the cake. We're like, oh, he's going to grab a chunk. He puts his hand on the cake. We're like, oh, he's just going to squish, squish into that cake. No. Wes just steadied the thing <laughs> and face-planted into it. <laughs> and that's how he, like, proceeded to eat the entire cake. He just, like, held it in place and just kind of, like, <laughs> like a chicken. <laughs> just managed to get all over his face. It was awesome. This has nothing to do with what I'm talking about tonight, but I just wanted to share it with you guys. Our life is fun. Our life is crazy with little ones at home. Uh, and something else that actually Megan has gotten into in the last few years has been this idea of like repurposing or like restoring old furniture. It's like a pretty cool hobby. Like we've benefited from this, this hobby. Uh, take this, this uh, table, for example, this white table right here. We had this for a long time. This is actually from Megan's grandmother's house. You can tell it's a grandmother table because it has dragon feet. <laughs> Megan took this table. She's like, yeah, this is, this is looking kind of old. She took it out to our garage. She stripped the paint. She refinished it. And now we have an awesome table. It's been elevated. You know, it's, it's really awesome. She, uh, she's always looking on Facebook Marketplace for people getting rid of like old furniture. Uh, she found this desk a few months ago that was pretty cool, but it was falling apart. She took it back. She restored it. She made it new again and flipped that puppy for some cash. It's pretty awesome. Uh, you know, when I think of Megan restoring things, it, it just makes me uh, think that, like, as a society, like, we're kind of obsessed with this idea of restorations. This idea of, like, making things new again. If you don't believe me, search for restorations on YouTube. You'll find, like, thousands of videos on people just, like, taking old stuff and making it work again. I mean, I just watched this video of someone who found this old axe head in the woods and I don't know why I watched this video. It was like 30 minutes long. This dude took this axe head. He brought it into his shop. He like, you know, scraped off all the rust. It's actually very cathartic to watch videos like this. He scraped off all the rust, found a new handle for it. He took this thing that was broken and restored it to its original purpose. And it looks awesome. You watch HGTV. People do these with houses. Pimp my ride. Yeah? Maybe I dated myself with that reference, but hey, when, when Exhibit showed up, you knew something's going to be awesome. It's getting restored. Hey, we're obsessed with this idea of restoration. I think what's also really cool about it is whenever they're done, say with this axe, we're not really necessarily impressed with the axe. We're really impressed with the restorer or the person who took the thing that was broken and made it new again. Why do we as people, why do we as humans resonate with this idea so much? I believe it's because this is exactly what God does in our lives. It's exactly what God does in our lives. You know, all of us, the Bible talks about, are, are, are sinful and separated from God. We're, we're, we're kind of broken. Whether we know it or not, sin has a negative impact on our life, and, and that separation from God uh, breaks us. But God is in the business of making things new. And what he does is he, he comes into our life and he restores us back to our original purpose. And at the end of the day, people see, man, this, this person's life is different, and they give glory to the restorer. They give glory to God. The Bible puts it this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, a new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All throughout the Bible, it talks about following God and placing your trust in Christ and how that transforms us. It makes us new. You know, maybe, maybe you're in this room and this is something that you've experienced. You've experienced God enter your life and change it. Maybe this is something that you've seen in the lives of your friends. 
So man, my friends started following Jesus and their life looks different. It's because what God, God is in the business of making things new. But maybe you're like me and you've experienced Christ make your life new, but you still sometimes struggle. Like, Christ has made you new, but sometimes you struggle with doubt. Sometimes you struggle with habits of sin. Sometimes you go through difficult seasons where you're just less passionate about God. Maybe that's just me, but I would guess some people in this room, if you're following Jesus, have felt these ways before. Well, I want to start by encouraging you that that's normal. I've felt that way, and that this whole idea of being restored and transformed by God is actually a process of ups and downs. It's a process, and so when we feel these, these, these seasons of doubt, these seasons of feeling maybe stuck, God wants to continue to help us grow. The Bible talks about how God started a good work in us that we could never start on our own. It's only by his grace. But that he's going to continue that good work. He's going to continue restoring and transforming our lives. So when we say, man, I've started following Christ. Why do I feel doubt? Why am I still stuck in the sin? Friends, we are still in the process. And, and tonight, I want to talk about how we can participate in that process. Because God, he wants to do something in your life, but he also invites you to be an active participant, an active participant in allowing him to change your life. So tonight we're going to talk about three ways we can participate with God in transforming our lives. Three ways we can participate with God in transforming our lives. And we're going to look at the book of Colossians. If anyone brought a Bible or wants to look, we'll be in Colossians chapter 3. And this is a, I think this is actually a pretty interesting book for us to look at because Colossians were, were, had some similar struggles that we have today. So the Apostle Paul, who wrote the book of Colossians to the Colossians, it's a letter, um, he knew that they were struggling with cultural pressures that were making them feel discouraged or confused. That it was hard for them to stay the course, and although they had, they had come to Christ and were following him, they were having trouble staying on track. And so in Colossians chapter 3, Paul uh, gives them some encouragement. Check it out. There we go. So since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Colossians chapter 3. So the first point I want to talk about as we you know, consider this idea of participating with God and transforming our lives, the first way we do so is by focusing on God. Focus on God. We see this sort of repeated idea throughout this passage of setting our hearts on things above, setting our minds on things above. You know, when Paul's talking about things above, he's talking about the things of God. What does God want? What does God desire? What does God's word say? What is his will for the world? Who is God? What is he like? What has he done? And we focus on the things of God. We, we, we focus on these things of who God is and what, and what he wants to do. And Paul also, interestingly, words this a couple different ways. He says, set your hearts on things above. By heart, he means desires. And when we start to align our desires with what God wants, that, that's part of focusing on him. He says, set your minds on the things above. Our mind is, is our thoughts. It's what we think about. It's what we dwell on. It's what we mull over. When he says, set your minds on things above, it's to think about the things of God. Man, if we want to participate with God in transforming our lives, this first thing we can do is focus on God. It's to align our desires with who he is and what he wants, and it's to, to think about, to meditate, to, to spend time chewing on that. It's developing our perspective. In a sense, it's setting our course. You know, the longer you travel off course, the further you'll be from the destination you want to end up at. Like, that's kind of obvious, right? <laughs> like, the further you travel off course, the further you'll be from the destination you want to you arrive at. Uh, I'm no aviation expert, but in aviation, there's this idea of the one in 60 rule. 
the one in 60 rule. So every, what this means is if you are one degree off course, every 60 nautical miles you travel, you'll be one mile off, off course. And so like with flying, like that doesn't seem like a whole lot, right? It's like, man, a plane can cover a mile, they can course correct real easily. But imagine if you're flying from New York City to LA, thousands of miles. If you're just one degree off, you're gonna miss LA by 40 miles. It's a big distance. That's the difference between like landing in your vacation destination and landing in the ocean. <laughs> so there's between like, you know, putting on your swim trunks to get in the pool and putting on your swim trunks and blowing up one of those sweet, you know, <laughs> life jackets with the straw, you know? <laughs> you don't want to be off by 40 miles, but all it takes is being one degree off course. You know, we talk about this idea of setting our minds on things above. It's kind of like course correcting, right? The way that we can practically do that is, is by daily meeting with God and dwelling on who he is and what he wants to accomplish. It's so easy to get off course, even just one degree off course, like other good things. You know, it's to just really set our focus on you know, social media or, or podcasts or, or books or politics, those which are not bad things, but if they become the thing we set our course on, we, st- we can start to drift. I wonder if sometimes we feel in our lives a distance from God or stuck in spiritual growth because we've set our focus on something else and we've started to drift. We can't afford to think we're on autopilot. We need to set course every day. So the first way that we participate with God in transforming our lives is to focus on God. The second way we participate with God in transforming our lives is to take off your old self. Take off your old self. I'll let you guys write that down, and then I'll explain what I mean by that. That sounds kind of funny. Take off your old self. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9, Paul continues. He says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices. So the repetition in this passage is this idea of of leaving behind. He actually uses a phrase a few times, you know, take off your old self, rid yourselves. That was a a sort of common phrase in the day for like taking off an an, an article of clothing you didn't use anymore. And he even uses some strong language at the beginning, you know, put to death. He he doesn't say, you know, like suppress these things or, or maybe just dabble in these things a little bit. Paul says, you know, these are things we should be done with. We need to take off the old self. Take off these ways that we once lived, like it's an old article of clothing. You know, if there's anything I've learned as a parent, it's that kids go through clothes like crazy. Like, I didn't realize this before I was a parent, but you know, like, baby clothes, like the first year of life, the clothes are, like, rated, I guess rated, sized by months. So, like, literally there's, like, zero to three months is, like, a size of baby. And after three months are over, you got to go to the three to six month clothes. Can you imagine how annoying and expensive it would be if you had to buy new clothes every three months? That's exactly what it's like to be a parent. <laughs> now, trust me, I, I love my kids. You know, it's awesome. But, but we got to, like, they are done with clothes very quickly. And sometimes it's not because they grow out of it. Sometimes it's because they do horrible things to their clothes that's unrecoverable. <laughs> like, we're talking explosive diarrhea. Like, projectile vomit. Like, we are talking about, like, the worst things you can imagine getting on articles of clothing. Like, you know, Wes did his thing, and it was like, bro, these pants are not going in my washing machine. These would ruin it. We are going to rid ourselves of these clothes. They're going in the outside trash can, and we are done. There's, <laughs> they're not fit to wear anymore. Now, it's a little bit of a silly analogy, but I wonder if that's part of the, like, the thought here was not simply leaving behind an old article of clothing because it didn't quite fit right, or maybe it was out of style. You know, Paul is talking about getting rid of a, a piece of clothing that's not fit to wear anymore. 
Like, I would never put those clothes back on my kids. What if we started to view sin like that? When we, and I believe when we start to understand um, God's care for us in asking us to not sin, in commanding us to not sin, um, you know, I think we, we gain a picture of what sin really does. It, it breaks our lives. It hurts us. It hurts others around us. And if we can sort of develop uh, this view that Paul is talking about here of, man, put to death, leave behind as if it is a gross article of clothing, I think we start to get the thought behind this passage and the reason why uh, God calls us to this. You know, there's another analogy just to uh, sort of reference Hebrews here. The writer of Hebrews puts it like this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. You know, similarly, imagine if you're running a, a 5K or a marathon with a, with a big weight vest on. You know, that would be way more difficult to move forward, right? But to take it off, to discard it, to leave it behind, allows us to run with perseverance. And again, our motivation is because of Jesus and what he's done. I wonder if sometimes in our life we feel stagnant or discouraged in our walk with God uh, because there's something that God is calling us to take off. Maybe there's an area of sin that we just um, are, are struggling with leaving behind. My encouragement for you would be um, to ask God to give you the strength and, and to maybe confess to some people you trust that you're struggling. Maybe that could, is what you need to continue moving forward, to throw off the weight, to throw off the, the clothes that are entangling us, uh, to move forward and keep growing with God. So the second way we participate with God in transforming our lives is by taking off our old self. The third way we participate with God in transforming our lives is to put on your new self. Put on your new self. So Paul just keeps rolling with the clothing analogy. He says, you know, we want to take off our old self. That's not, not fitting for us anymore. We want to rid ourselves of those clothes that are unfit to wear. And we want to put on our new self. See what he has to say. He says, don't lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. So Paul, again, he uses this phrase, put on the new self. And what this includes is being changed. It's being renewed in knowledge. It's, it's to grow in our understanding of who God is and what he's calling us to. Um, and it, but it's also to be formed into the image of the creator, that God is calling us to be more like him, that Jesus is calling us to be more like him, which is an amazing calling. He continues on to say, no matter your background, no matter where you're from, uh, no matter your life situation, um, the calling is the same for all, that we can be unified together um, in following after Christ in this way. And he continues, he says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, Bear with, one in, with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. We see here that, you know, not only are we called in following God to, to put off our old self, but it's to walk in kind of this new way. It's to put on these qualities that God calls us to, things like compassion, kindness, humility. You see, following Jesus isn't just about not doing things, but it's actually about living out a lifestyle that God is calling us to, and that he gives us the grace to live out. This is something I missed for the longest time. Like when I was um, a teenager uh, going to church, I actually didn't love church <laughs> because I thought it was just all about not doing things. I thought the Bible was this rule book. It was like, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. You know, teenage me who wasn't following Christ was like, but those are all the things I want to do. <laughs> 
I didn't understand that God was calling us to so much more than simply no, simply don't. God was calling us to live a life marked by connection with him and other people, with the ability to love and support others, with the ability to show others the light of God and make an impact. I didn't realize it was just, it was something that was so much bigger than me just living in my like little sin world that I was like fine with, you know. God doesn't just call us to take things off. He calls us to put things on and to live out a new calling. But sometimes, you know, this is harder. Sometimes it's harder to do the right thing than just like not do wrong things, you know. Sometimes it can be difficult to be patient. Sometimes it can be difficult to be generous or forgiving when someone has wronged you. But we need to wear the clothes that match our identity. It can be pretty awkward to not be wearing the right clothes to the right situation. You know what I mean? Like, you guys ever been in that situation where you're just, like, not dressed correctly? I mean, yeah, there's things like the gym. It's like, bro, you got to wear shoes in this gym if you're going to lift weights. Like, that, that makes sense. That's just safety. You know, there's other situations like, oh, I'm kind of underdressed for this thing. This is a little awkward, but, you know, it's fine. Or like, oh, I, I put on the suit, and I shouldn't have done that. I guarantee I have the most awkward story of not wearing the right thing at the right time. I guarantee it. It's my freshman year in college, and uh, we're at orientation week. And what we did at my school is, you know, we did all this, like, team building stuff for, like, a week. I don't know what you guys do here, but that's, this is what we did. And one day we went to, like, this campground. So we all, all, like, the entire freshman class, granted my school was, like, 3,000 undergrads, so the entire freshman class was like smaller than some of your high schools. <laughs> but well, a whole freshman class gets on this bus, and we go out to this campground in the you know, middle of nowhere. We're in Oklahoma, and uh, we have like some stuff indoors, some assemblies, some stuff outdoors. Well, it's lunchtime, and we decide that we're going to play Ultimate Frisbee. It's a hot day in Oklahoma. Like, it's humid. We're all sweating. So, you know, what do you do? You go tarps off. So we took off our shirts. We're playing Ultimate Frisbee. This is not the weird part. This is normal. Everyone else has their shirts off. Like, it's in contextually, this is right, you know? So here I am, shirtless, playing Ultimate Frisbee. Like, okay, we win. Yeah, we high-five everyone. We go to go inside to hear from our next speaker. And I look around, I'm like, where did I put that shirt? I thought I put it on that log. <laughs> hmm. Okay, no big deal. I'll just find the shirt of the person who took my shirt, right? Like, there's two of us. There's got to be two shirts at play here. Like, I'll just, I'll find that shirt. <laughs> I look around, there's, there's no shirt in sight. And this isn't just like a situation where, like, you can just go back to the dorm room, get another shirt. Like, we rode a bus to get here. I'm not getting a shirt, man. <laughs> I, 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 like, minimum, have to ride the bus back. <laughs> what would you do in that situation? Well... Guys, I was 18. I just went into the assembly. <laughs> and I'd like to tell you, I like, remember what happened after that. But I don't, I just, like, assume someone got my shirt. But I think I, like, blacked out from embarrassment and, like, my brain deleted the memory. Because <laughs> I honestly can't tell you what happened. Like, I know everything that happened after that. It can be pretty awkward if you're not wearing the right clothes for the situation. Similarly, when we, say, when we are following Christ, you know, we are called to a purpose. And it wouldn't quite make much sense if we weren't clothed in these things yet claimed to be followers of Jesus. You know, God says, this is the good work I want to do in your life. This is the good work you can participate in. And so how, how do we clothe ourselves? It goes back to our first point. It's focusing on God. It's seeing what he's about. It's, it's course correcting. Whenever we course correct and focus on who God is, um, we understand what he's calling us to. So let me, illust- let me illustrate like this. The three ways that we can participate with God in our life is one, by focusing on him. Two, it's by taking off the old self. And three, it's by putting on the new. So, so what do we do? Well, daily, we need to course correct, right? So we wake up, we read our Bible, and we say, God, I pray that you would just reveal yourself to me. I pray that you would reveal yourself to me through your word, Lord, that we could get closer, that I would understand more what you're about. And this allows us to set our hearts and our minds on him. And so as, as we connect with God through reading his Bible and praying, what happens? Connect with God, all of a sudden... 
know if these clothes are, 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 are fitting quite right anymore. Like, anger doesn't smell so good anymore. And we start to be revealed, not from ourselves, but from God himself, starts to reveal to us things in our lives that need to change. And we say, man, this really is not a good smell. Like, I need to take this shirt off. <laughs> like, this is, not, this is not great. I'm kind of scared. Like, this has been part, this, like, anger's been a part of my life for a long time. It's how I've dealt with stuff. I don't know how to function without it. But that's where God's grace comes in. We say, God, I trust you. Lord, help me to take this off. And humbly, <laughs> with God's help, we can start to remove the things that are, that are weighing us down, the things that are making us live a life that's not glorifying to God. But it doesn't stop there. Because as we read, we hear that God doesn't just say, don't be angry, but he says to clothe yourselves in compassion and kindness and goodness and have patience. And all of a sudden, God starts to provide these things in our lives when we focus on him. And we go, whoa, this is awkward at first. But then we start to have our lives changed. And we start to say, man, by the power of God by, and his Holy Spirit, man, my life is starting to look different. And we can't take the credit. People start giving glory to the restorer because they see our life changing. That's what it looks like to participate with God in transforming our lives. It's to focus on him. It's to take off the old and put on the new. And this can only be done by his grace with his help. We can't do it on our own. I wanted to ask my friend Chris to come on up here and uh, talk a little bit about what this looked like in his life. So give it up for Chris. Everybody hear me? No? Yeah? Okay. Okay, so, yeah, I'm Chris. Um, yeah, growing up, I didn't really grow up in a Christian household. Um, I would only go to church on Easter because, like, my mom and my dad said it was the right thing to do. And if I didn't, I might go to hell. So, a little scary. So, I would only really pray to this white-bearded guy in the sky if I did something wrong so I wouldn't go to hell. Um, but, yeah, um, all I really wanted to do was just kind of pursue sports and to be cool all I cared about was really like what others thought of me and I remember like I would change outfits in the middle of the day in high school if like someone made fun of the clothing or stuff like I would literally bring two pairs of clothes to school like just throw it in my trunk and change in the middle of the day um so fast forward to college um I got away from this kind of bullying and insecurity in high school and transitioned into like the gym bro hookup culture party animal identity where I found validation in that I thought this was this was it this was like peak life right here like nothing can get better than this um and so sophomore year I wanted more of that and I rushed Phi Delta Theta and where I met Jack Harris and me and Jack started hanging out and every time we hung out we'd always have some deep conversation about God um and I vividly remember I was like dude like he told me he was waiting for marriage, and I was like, are you Mormon? I was like, isn't that what only, like, Mormons do? I was, like, freaking out. And so I gave him the nickname for the rest of Rush called Norman the Mormon. Um, so turns out Jack wasn't a Mormon, but he was a Christian, and he ended up actually sharing the gospel with me. And he talked about how I can go to heaven just by accepting Christ and following him, that it's not by me being a good person. And I believed in Jesus because heaven was promised. And that's really all I wanted to do with him. So I continue to just live in my sin with this promise like, oh, now I'm going to heaven now because I believe in Jesus. That's all great. Um, and God, as Wright says, he is still in my sin, acknowledgement of him, pursued me. And God used my financial and disciplined struggles to bring me closer to him and to sign me up for Kaleo. And so I went to Kaleo and I experienced Jesus and how he changed the lives of others so drastically. I remember actually talking with Alex the day before I gave my life to Christ. And I was asking him a bunch of questions I was like, okay, so you're telling me Hitler. Like, if he was a follower of Jesus, he would be forgiven. And I was like, he was like, well, yeah, I mean, by the grace of God, I'm like, no way. No freaking way. And so, like, just in that moment, it made me realize how perfect and wonderful he is and how much Jesus truly loves me. And on June 9th, 2022, I gave my life to Christ. And everything in my life got way more fun. I found so much joy in my identity in him, and I'm no longer scared of death because I am going to heaven. God didn't take anything from my life that I thought he would, that I thought I would lose by following him. 
and said he added things that made me aware of the true purpose in life, which is to glorify him. Like, I was a huge party animal. I'm still a huge party animal. Just being sober at parties is way more fun, I promise you. Um, and I just finally had, like, a drive and plan to pursue my goals and aspirations to put behind this, like, laziness that I had. Um, I started living a life with just no worries and with joy and love for Jesus and others, and that is so freeing. He added an eternal joy in my life. And just, like, looking around this room, like, I've prayed for people to be in this room and just, like, seeing them here. Like, Jesus is, it's just proof that he's living and active in our lives, and he's the most real thing on this earth. And I urge you just to follow him with all your hearts. I believed in God because heaven was promised, but I followed God because he loved me first more than anybody else. Thank you, guys. Yeah, that's awesome. What, a, what an incredible story of God restoring things. You know, Glory to God for, for that. So the way that we participate with God in transforming our lives is by focusing on him, it's taking off the old, it's putting on the new. All this is with his help. So where do we go from here? You know, I do want to acknowledge the time of year it is. It's like, this is like the last Stumo I've, I've heard. Is that right? Yeah. This is the officially, officially the last Stumo. <laughs> Mitch just made that happen. <laughs> no, the, the, but, but on a serious note, like the, the semester's winding down. Like maybe you're in this room and you've had an awesome year. Maybe you started following Christ and you've been growing. Um, I guess my, my question I want to pose tonight is, is what's next? What's the plan for this summer to continue in these things? You know, God started a good work in us. Um, what are you going to do to participate with God in transforming your life this summer? You know, maybe some of you are going to work a job or an internship. And that's awesome. That's, that's a really good opportunity. How can you keep the focus on God and not start to drift? This is something I struggle with. I love my job, right? <laughs> and how do, I, how do I not make that everything? How do I continue to focus on who God is? It's through his word and through community. What will your plan be this summer to focus on God? You know, maybe you're doing something uh, for spiritual um, growth. Like maybe you're going to Kaleo this summer. Man, what an awesome opportunity. I've been to like a thousand Kaleos. They're all, <laughs> they've all been good. <laughs> They're really cool. Um, don't think that just because you're going to Kaleo, you are going to grow. Man, the heart that you bring in matters a ton. Maybe you're sitting here, you're going to Kaleo this summer, but you say, hey, there's this one area of my life I'm not ready to take off or put on. I would encourage you, consider what it would be like to give that to God. Start asking God now, hey, how can I give this to you, Lord? How can I let you into this area of my life to transform me? The way that we are transformed by, tr by God comes down to how much we trust him. When we focus on him, take off the old, put on the new. Let me pray for us. Um, Lord, we just praise you that you uh, are a good God, that you are a restorer, that you are in the business of making things new. God, I just thank you for what you've done in my life, what you've done in Chris's life. God, what an amazing story to hear. And what you've done in the lives of, of many in this room, Lord. I uh, just thank you for your goodness and your grace that you might take us when we're broken in our sin and, and restore us um, to be used for your purposes, to live life to the fullest. Uh, God, I pray that you give each and every person in this room wisdom on what the next step is, that you give us just the desire and the, the discipline and the energy and the passion to want to focus on you. And God, I pray for those in this room who are maybe considering uh, whether or not that they'll follow you, God. Maybe they've seen a fraternity, brother, sorority, sister, their life change, uh, and they're, they're considering this decision for themselves. God, I pray that you would just give them clarity on this topic. I pray that you would just help them to understand what it looks like to follow you, and God, that they would make that decision to make you Lord. Uh, all these things in your name. Amen.